How does the electrical grid respond to a crisis? Electrical grids distribute electricity throughout the country, powering our homes, our offices, our lives. Utilities have lots of practice repairing lines downed by fallen trees. But what happens when widespread or unusual calamities strike and the electrical grid is at risk? For decades, reliability has been the watchword for electric utilities. Now, there's a focus on a related concept, resilience. Find out more in Mechanical Engineering Magazine's special report. This program is brought to you in part by ComSol. See what is possible with multi-physics simulation. If the power goes out after a thunderstorm, utility crews are on the job within hours to restore service and get the lights back on. Most electric utilities in the U.S. have a reputation for reliability and recovering from situations like this. It has gained notice as planners began thinking about increased natural disasters brought on by climate change, man-made interference due to malicious cyber attacks, and the instability brought about by adding large quantities of renewable energy. Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans and southern Louisiana in 2005, and Sandy in 2012 blacked out parts of New York City for days. In 2015, a team of gunmen used rifles to attack the Metcalf transmission substation near San Jose, California. And essentially what happened was all the communications, data and voice communications to the substation were cut. And then either a lone actor or a number of uh, snipers shot um, up all of the transformers. So they completely took a pretty major substation out of service. According to reports, the damage took weeks to repair at a cost of $15 million. More recently, the prospect of the coronavirus pandemic has focused electric grid operators on how to handle widespread personnel disruptions. The resiliency of the electric grid is a concept that still doesn't have a hard and fast definition. Resilience has become a legitimate field of study involving industry, academia, and government labs, complete with experts in the field. The federal government under the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, um, FERC, and the North American Reliability Corporation, NERC, actually have regulations and standards that govern that base reliability. Um, when you kind of move past those reliability standards and think about, you know, I almost call them multiple things that could happen. So we have to be reliable in a windstorm, but if you have a windstorm, in conjunction with other things that are happening on the system, maybe fires and stuff like that, it, it creates multiple levels of failure and contingencies. And that, that's where you really start to get into resilience. It's this idea of going beyond the reliability criteria that already exists because of multiple failures. The Electric Power Research Institute describes resiliency as involving prevention of damage rapid recovery after an event, and survivability, or the ability to maintain some basic level of electrical functionality to individual consumers or communities in the event of a complete loss of electrical service from the distribution system. The kinds of challenges that utilities and grid operators are contemplating have increased in severity over the last decade. According to a 2017 study by the Rhodium Group, the average residential electricity customer experiences one to two outages a year. Most of these are small scale. Typically, power is restored in little more than two hours absent some major event. But major events play an outsized role in the statistics. From 2012 to 2016, the widespread blackouts from a single event, Hurricane Sandy, caused nearly 32% of the service disruption measured in customer hours. Individual utilities are responsible for the distribution lines going to customers, while regional transmission organizations and independent system operators supervise competitive electricity markets 
and manage the high voltage electricity grid to ensure reliability. They're also responsible for planning and designing the system up to 15 years in the future. The key is to be proactive rather than reactive. For instance, PJM began anticipating the moves it would need to make to protect control room dispatchers from a potential coronavirus outbreak even before the first cases were reported in the United States. The, the COVID pandemic is probably a good example of those kind of multiple failures that you have the potential to operate under um, if you couple them with other disasters that could happen. So for instance, if you had the COVID um, affecting the employee, staff, and operators at multiple generators and substations across the system, and we had a hurricane, the system wasn't necessarily designed from that perspective. So that gives you um, kind of the criteria that you're moving beyond reliability. And thinking about that, designing to that, is really what resilience is all about. Bryson was involved in PJM's fuel security initiative. A comprehensive study looked for vulnerabilities to generators' fuel delivery systems, the corresponding effects on capacity availability, and the overall impact on system reliability. The fuel mix is changing dramatically, and you have a couple of different phenomena, Bryson said. One is that the amount of coal is reducing, and the amount of natural gas is increasing. That's been a combination of the natural gas coming from the gas shale formation in Pennsylvania and Ohio, gas being very inexpensive. Then, in 2020, the coronavirus pandemic COVID-19 hit, and the whole country went into lockdown. More people began working from home than ever before. The electrical grid moves electricity from the generators to where it is needed. But once in a while, that flow of electricity is interrupted, sometimes by small things, and sometimes by large things like a global pandemic. How else can you improve the resilience of an electrical grid? Bryson offers an example. One of the approaches that our transmission owners and PJM developed is this concept of rather than trying to protect a critical substation, make the critical substation not critical. And you do that by potentially changing the way the design is. So a good example is if you have a major substation that has four high voltage lines that run into it and that's what makes it critical, let's take one of those lines and route it to a different substation. The academic world is contributing to resiliency measures too. At North Carolina State University, the Future Renewable Electric Energy Delivery and Management, or FREEDOM, Systems Engineering Research Center, was created through funding from the National Science Foundation in 2008 to modernize the electrical grid to accommodate sustainable energy, such as wind and solar power. The FREEDOM Center has been involved in developing online tools for assessing vulnerabilities to address cyber-physical security called distributed grid intelligence. The hope is that smart microgrids with sensors embedded throughout the system might be more resilient to failure and easier to bring back online than large multi-state electric grids. But the emerging smart grid, together with distributed renewable energy such as rooftop solar, presents a new set of challenges to resilience. The smart grid involves more distributed energy down to the home level. That kind of penetration adds a level of vulnerability of a cyber threat. We certainly have to pay attention to that as the grid gets smarter. We're looking at the reliability aspects. Part of it is the intermittent nature of renewables. Renewable energy typically flows in the reverse direction from conventional power, something for which the grid wasn't designed. According to Iqbal Hussein, director of the Freedom Center and a professor of electrical engineering at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. The load always has to match the generation. The Freedom Center has been looking at hardware, too. The center has been developing a solid-state transformer, SST, as a replacement for the conventional transformers seen on pole tops and at substations. It has all the functionalities of a regular transformer stepping up or down, but in addition, it has electronics that allow us to control the power flow. The SST can take power from excess energy generation and put it in storage 
and then release it when there is more load and less renewable energy, such as in the early evenings. You know, we, we analyze those, uh, you know, design. So we see that there is a very high uh, uh, frequency uh, switching, I know, uh, which is in the range of two to three megavolts per microseconds, which is much more than the lightning strike itself. The solid state transformer can manage that power distribution so that there's always a balance between the load and generation. Besides natural disasters, cyber attacks, and renewable energy, several other less visible factors can affect grid resilience. In New York State, which has been especially hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic, 37 workers of the state's independent system operator volunteered to sequester themselves at two electric grid control centers. The 33 grid operators and managers, two facilities workers, and two food service staff members were living in trailers without contact with the outside world in order to maintain their health and the stability of the state electric grid. According to Bryson, another one being worked on is geomagnetic disturbance. The sun has the ability to cause disruption to the power system, and it happens fairly frequently. Like many resilience-oriented preparations, the steps seem like a lot of work for a far-fetched situation until they are called upon in desperate hours to keep the lights on.